wanted to make some portable forges that didn't need any electricity. So effectively got about a two inch lining in there of a, a refractory cement that I made up myself. So it's fire clay, brick dust, anything else I could throw in. Just to stop the heat getting to the outside of the bucket too much and melting the galve. Um, when I cast, I used an old saucepan in the middle as a former to get the hole in the middle. Ram the mix round it. While I was doing that, I had a pipe, this metal pipe, this, this long, poking through, because that's quite, that does get hot here, but it's not too bad there. And that's to facilitate me connecting a plastic air pump to it. Then I can use this with a foot, it's two hands free, which is handy for working. So that blasts air into the middle, and then in the forge, you can probably see there where the air blast comes out. We've got the hot coals in there, charcoal. So I'll put some fresh charcoal in. Put some more air in it, we'll get a good heat in it. Uh, it won't take too long because the bucket's already nice and warm. That might as well be getting warm while it's warming up. You can see underneath now it's getting a good heat in there. And it's quite a high carbon steel this, so I don't want it to get too hot because otherwise you start to burn the carbon out of it. So I really only want to work it from a, a good orange red down to where I can't see it in daylight. Because in daylight you can't see the colours as well as if it were in the dark. So it's always a bit hotter than you think. But gets really nice heat and these little forges are just great for making small knives it's fantastic so I've probably got enough points on that now to what I want so the next time I'm just going to take the corners off uh, round it at this end a bit put a little loop in there then bend it back the other way for the fire seal so we'll get that hot again now it's a quite a cost-effective way of forging. Because the fire's contained and very small, there's not a lot of wasted heat, really. So we're just taking the corners off this now. Which is quite a gentle process. And while I've got some heat in it, I'm just going to knock the, the end over. So effectively that's the finished form. Um, I will clean this end up with a file later, but that's the sort of shape I want now. And I'll let that cool naturally after I've just straightened it out a little bit more. And then we'll cut it, uh, clean that surface up, take it back to red heat and plunge it in water to harden it. Okay, so. When that's gone cold, we'll cut that off. Then when I've cut it, I would get it to red hot again and plunge it into water. And what that does, it alters the molecular structure of the steel and hardens it. It becomes what they call glass hard. And that then allows the flint to knock off a small enough particle that it'll set fire. Because iron is pyrophoric, which means it wants to burn at room temperature. It can't do that because of its mass. So if I was to roll that out over two square miles, it would just set fire. And that's why iron rusts, it's trying to oxidise and get back to this state it wants to be in. So if I didn't harden this piece of steel, 
and it, the flint would still cut it, but it'd cut more of a slither off than the particle, and that slither would have um, too much mass for it to burn. When it becomes hardened by getting red hot, quenching it in the water, it becomes glass hard, and then when the, it hits against the flint, the flint actually chips off a minute particle, and the surface area of that particle is then sufficient compared to the mass for it to burn. So the little sparks you see here, they're particles of steel doing what they want to do naturally, and that's burn. What you also need in the fire lighting kit is some what they call char cloth, and that is basically carbonised cloth. So it has to be natural materials, so cotton or we use denim, old jeans, cut into squares. I put them in a tin that's excluded from oxygen. There's a few little holes in to let the smoke and the gases out. And basically we cook it exactly the same as charcoal's made and it takes out all the oils and everything out of the denim. And when that's finished burning, we let it go cold, open the tin and it's turned into char cloth. So that was denim and now it's carbonised denim, which is char cloth. So that's the tinder box. The tinder is what catch the sparks. So Harry's now got a piece of flint that he's going to use to um, generate sparks off the steel. He's also holding a bit of char cloth in a place where he's hoping the spark's going to land. <laughs> there you go. That's it, right? If you take that in, so you can, if you blow on it, so you can see it better. So it, there's no need to blow on this. This is just purely so you can see it's smouldering away and how easy it burns. Then normally we'd have some dry grass, but because of the weather today, we haven't got that. So I'll quickly grab a piece of paper. And so effectively, this is the um, ball of grass and dry uh, mosses and things. And you, again, you're blowing into that to generate more heat and you get flames. It's natural materials you want. So I use all my own genes and that. And it seems to be that I've never had a problem before this last couple of batches, and I think Maybe some of the jeans aren't 100% cotton. I think it's like these new materials and that. If you've got good, good char cloth or good tinder, there isn't a big problem with this technique. It's easy to generate sparks, catching them's a hard bit. And if you've got good tinder, well, you could see then when they changed the tinder over to a different batch, which was probably sort of decent Levi jean or something rather than a Primark or whatever, <laughs> um, it caught straight away. So once again, buying cheap isn't always the best way. <laughs> <laughs> leaving that on the floor now to cool off because if I open that up now it's still hot and the inrush of oxygen would allow it all to burn and it just burn away so you've got to let it go cold open it up and it should be carbonised and then you've got good tinder it probably took an hour at the most and that's quite a big batch you can do them the best way I've done them before is in a little shoe polish tin and you just knock a hole in the lid with a nail fill the shoe polish tin up put it on the barbecue 10 minutes max, it's done. Take it off another 10 minutes for it to cool. You've got good, good char cloth. But a small quantity, we go through quite a bit at demonstrating, so I'm just making a bigger quantity there. So it holds the heat longer and takes longer to warm up and everything. So uh, originally it was in California and where I was teaching was in the Central Valley. It was just hot as hell in the summer. But the same people on this beautiful mountain retreat only an hour's drive away and it was a like 7,000 feet, so it was nice, you know, it was just nice 80 degrees all day long. I said, hell, why aren't we doing the school up there? And they said, oh, we ain't got the electric power and that. And so that was the first seeds of looking about for alternative ways and that. Um, and then that grew because it's great for shows. Yeah, you don't need power. They can put you in the middle of a field, so you're, you're um, more user-friendly for them. They don't have to worry about you. Um, and the other thing is you get, there's no pap testing. There's none of this, like ridiculous hopes you have to jump through. They just come and think, okay, we're classic as a barbecue. And from a teaching point of view, they're really good. Because we're using charcoal all the time, I can stop, talk to people. If it was coke, you stop for 10 minutes and the fire's gone out. It needs a constant air blow through it. This, I could go away, have my dinner, have a beer, come back, pump it, it'd be away again. Like we've just seen there, it was empty. Fill it up, it's away.